Hi, this is Urantian Artist welcoming you to our 21st episode titled The 100. Students of the Revelation will know what that title refers to. However, if you are new to the Revelation, you may read at least paper 66 so you will understand how devastating the rebellion was. The outbreak of re rebellion on Jerusalem, the capital of Sultania, was broadcast by the Melchizedek Council. The emergency Melchizedeks were immediately dispatched to Jerusalem and Gabriel volunteered to act as the representative of the Creator's Son, whose th authority had been challenged. With this broadcast of the fact of rebellion in Satania, the system was isolated, quarantined from her sister sy systems. There was war in heaven. The headquarters of Satania and it spread to every planet in the local system. On Urantia, 40 members of the corporal staff of 100, including Van, refused to join the insurrection. Many of the staff's human assistants, modified and otherwise, were also brave and noble defenders of Michael and his universe government. There was a terrible loss of personalities among seraphim and cherubim. Almost one half of the administrator and transition seraphim assigned to the planet joined their leader and Dalagasta in support of the cause of Lucifer. 40,119 of the primary midway creatures joined hands with Caligasta but the remainder of these beings remain true to their trust. The traitorous prince marshaled the disloyal midway creatures and other groups of rebel personalities and organized them to execute his bidding. While Van assembled the loyal midwares and other faithful groups and began the great battle for the salvation of the planetary staff and other marooned celestial personalities. During the times of this struggle, the loyalists dwelt in an unwalled and poorly protected settlement a few miles to the east of Dalmatia, but their dwellings were guarded day and night by the alert and ever watchful loyal midway creatures and they had possession of the priceless tree of life. Upon the outbreak of rebellion, loyal cherubim and seraphim, with the aid of three faithful midwares, assumed the custody of the tree of life and permitted only the forty loyalists of the staff and their associated modified mortals to partake of the fruit and leaves of this energy plant. There were 56 of these modified andite associates of the staff, 16 of the andite attendants of the disloyal staff refused to go into rebellion with their masters. And throughout the seven crucial years of the Caligasta Rebellion, Van was wholly devoted to the work of ministry to his loyal army of men, midwares, and angels. The spiritual insight and moral steadfastness which enabled Van to maintain such an unshakable attitude of loyalty to the universe government was the product of clear thinking, wise reasoning, logical judgment, sincere motivation, unselfish purpose, intelligent loyalty, experiential memory, disciplined character, and the unquestioning dedication 
of his personality to the doing of the will of the Father in paradise. This seven years of waiting was a time of heart searching and soul discipline. Such crisis in the affairs of a universe demonstrate the tremendous influence of mind as a factor in spiritual choosing. Education, training, and experience are factors in most of the vital decisions of all evolutionary moral creatures, but it is entirely possible for the indwelling spirit to make direct contact with the decision-determining powers of the human personality so as to empower the fully consecrated will of the creature to perform amazing acts of loyal devotion to the will and the way of the Father in paradise. And this is just what occurred in the experience of Amadon, the modified human associate of Anne. Callie, thank you very much for being my associate and joining me for this podcast honoring the Loyal 100. It is truly inspiring to read how single individuals were able to make a difference by their loyalty. Would you read to us about the heroes of the rebellion? Amadon is the outstanding human hero of the Lucifer Rebellion. This male descendant of Andon and Fonta was one of the 100 who contributed life plasm to the prince's staff, and ever since that event, he has been attached to Van as his associate and human assistant. Amadon elected to stand with his chief throughout the long and trying struggle, and it was an inspiring sight to behold this child of the evolutionary races, standing unmoved by the sophistries of Dalagostia, while throughout the seven-year struggle he and his loyal assistants resisted with unyielding fortitude all of the deceptive teachings of the brilliant Kalagastya. Kalagastya, with the maximum of intelligence and a vast experience in universe affairs, went astray, embraced sin. Amadon, with a minimum of intelligence and utterly devoid of universe experience, remained steadfast in the service of the universe and in loyalty to his associate. Van utilized both mind and spirit in the magnificent and effective combination of intellectual determination and spiritual insight, thereby achieving an experimental level of personality realization of the highest attainable order. Mind and spirit, when fully united, are potential for the creation of superhuman values even Marancha realities. There is no end to the recital of the stirring events of these tragic days, but at last, the final decision of the last personality was made, and then, but only then, did a most high evidentia arrive with the emergency Melchizedeks to seize authority on Urantia. The Kalagastia panoramic rain records on Jerusalem were obli obliterated and the probationary era of planetary rehabilitation was inaugurated. When the final roll call was called, the corporal members of the fa prince's staff were found to have aligned themselves as follows. Van and his entire court of coordination had remained loyal. Ang and three members of the food council had survived. The board, met, the board of animal husbandry were all swept into rebellion as were all of the animal conquest advisors. Fad and five members of the educational faculty were saved. Nod and all of the commission on industry and trade joined Caligastia. Hap and the entire college of revealed religion remained loyal with Van and his noble band. Lute and the whole board of health were lost. The Council of Art and Science remained loyal, but its entirety but Toot and the Commission on Tribal Government all went astray. Thus were 40 out of the 100 saved, later be to be transferred to Jerusalem while they resumed their paradise journey. The presence of these extraordinary supermen and superwomen stranded by rebellion 
and presently mating with the sons and daughters of earth, easily gave origin to those traditional stories of the gods coming down to mate with mortals, and thus originated the thousand and one legends of a mythical nature, but founded on the facts of the post-rebellion days, which later found a place in the folk tales and traditions of the various peoples whose ancestors had participated in these contracts with the Nodites and their descendants. The staff re re rebels, deprived of spiritual sustenance, eventually died a natural death, and much of the subsequent idolatry of the human races grew out of the desire to perpetuate the memory of these highly honored beings of the days of Caligasta. When the staff of 100 came to your answer, they were temporarily detached from their thought adjusters. Immediately upon the arrival of the Melchizedek receivers, the loyal personalities, except Van, were returned to Jerusalem and were reunited with their waiting adjusters. We know not the fate of the 60 staff rebels. Their adjusters still tarry on Jerusalem. Matters will undoubtedly rest as they now are until the entire Lucifer Rebellion is finally educated and the fate of all participants decreed. It was very difficult for such beings as angels and midwayers to conceive of brilliant and trusted rulers like Caligasta and Dalagasta going astray, committing tra traitorous sin. Those beings who fell into sin, they did not deliberately or premeditatively enter upon rebellion, were misled by their superiors, deceived by their trusted leaders. It was likewise easy to win the support of the primitive-minded evolutionary mortals. The vast majority of all human and superhuman beings who were victims of the Lucifer Rebellion on Jerusalem and the various misled planets have long since heartily repented of their folly, and we truly believe that all such sincere penitents will in some manner be rehabilitated and restored to some phase of universe service when the Ancient of Days finally complete the adjudication of the affairs of Sotania Rebellion, which they have so recently begun. Great confusion reigned in Dalmatia and thereabout for almost 50 years after the instigation of rebellion. The complete and radical reorganization of the whole world was attempted. Revolution displaced evolution as the policy of cultural advancement and racial improvement. Among the superior and partially trained sojourners in and near Dalmatia, there appeared a sudden advancement in cultural status. But when these new and radical methods were attempted on the outlying peoples, indescribable confusion and racial pandemonium was the immediate result. Liberty was quickly translated into license by the half-evolved primitive men of those days. Very soon after the rebellion, the entire staff of sedition were engaged in energetic defense of the city against the hordes of semi-savages who besieged its walls as a result of the doctrines of liberty which had been prematurely taught them. And years before the beautiful headquarters went down beneath the southern waves, the misled and mistaught tribes of the Dalmantia hinderlands had already swept down in semi-savage assault on the splendid city, driving the succession staff and their associates northward. The Caligastia scheme for the immediate reconstruction of human society in accordance with its ideas of individual freedom and group liberties 
proved a swift and more or less complete failure. Society quickly sank back to its old biologic level, and the forward struggle began all over again, starting not very far in advance of where it was at the beginning of the Caligastia regime, this upheaval having left the world in confusion, worse, confounded. The 162 years after the rebellion, a tidal wave swept up over Dalamancha, and the planetary headquarters sank beneath the waters of the sea, and this land did not again emerge until almost every vestige of the noble culture of those splendid ages had been obliterated. When the first capital of the world was engulfed, it harbored only the lowest types of Sangic races of Urantia, renegades who had already converted the Father's Temple into a shrine dedicated to Nog, the false god of light and fire. The followers of Van early withdrew to the highlands west of India, where they were exempt from attacks by the confused races of the lowlands, and from which place of retirement they planned for the rehabilitation of the world as their early Badenite predecessors had once all unwittingly worked for the welfare of mankind just before the days of the birth of the Sangeet tribes. Before the arrival of the Melchizedek receivers, Van placed the administration of human affairs in the hands of ten commissions of four each, groups identical with those of the prince's regime. The senior resident life carriers assumed temporary leadership of this council of 40, which functioned throughout the seven years of waiting. Similar groups of Amodenites assumed these responsibilities when the 39 loyal staff members returned to Jerusalem. These Amodenites were derived from the group of 144 loyal Andonites to which Amadon belonged and who have become known by his name. This group comprised 39 men and 105 women. 56 of this number were of immortality status and all except Amadon were translated along with the loyal members of the staff. The remainder of this noble band continued on earth to the end of their mortal days under the leadership of Van and Amadon. They were the biologic leaven which multiplied and continued to furnish leadership for the world down through the long dark ages of the post-rebellion era. Van was left on Urantia until the time of Adam, remaining as titular head of all superhuman personalities functioning on the planet. He and Amadon were sustained by the technique of the Tree of Life in conjunction with the specialized life ministry of the Melchizedeks for over 150 years thousand years. The affairs of Urantia were for a long time administered by a council of planetary receivers, twelve Melchizedeks, confirmed by the mandate of the senior constellation ruler, the Most High Father of Norlachadet. Associated with the Melchizedek receivers was an advisory council consisting of one of the loyal aides of the fallen prince, the two resident life carriers, a trinitized son in apprenticeship training, a volunteer teacher son, a brilliant evening star of Avalon periodically, the chiefs of seraphim and cherubim, advisors from two neighboring planets, the director general of subordinate angelic life, and Van, the commander-in-chief of the Midway Creatures. And thus was Urantia governed and administered until the arrival of Adam. 
It is not strange that the courageous and loyal band was assigned a place on the Council of Planetary Receivers, which for so long administered the affairs of Urantia. The twelve Melchizedek receivers of Urantia did heroic work. They preserved the remnants of civilization, and their planetary policies were faithfully executed by Van. Within one thousand years after the rebellion, he had more than 350 advanced groups scattered abroad in the world. These outposts of civilization consisted largely of the descendants of the loyal Andonites, slightly admixed with the Sandgate races, particularly the Blue Men and with the Nodites. Notwithstanding the terrible setback of rebellion, there were many good strains of biological promise on Earth. Under the supervision of the Melchizedek receivers, Van and Amadon continued the work of fostering the natural evolution of the human race, carrying forward the physical evolution of man until it reached that culminating attainment which warranted the dispatch of a material son and daughter to Urantia. Van and Amadon remained on Earth until shortly after the arrival of Adam and Eve. Some years thereafter, they were translated to Jerusalem, where Van was reunited with his awaiting adjuster. Van now serves in behalf of Urantia, while awaiting the order to go forward on the long, long trail to paradise perfection and the unrevealed destiny of the assembling core of mortal finality. It should be recorded that when Van appeased to the most highs of Edentia after Lucifer had sustained Caligastia and Urantia, the constellation fathers dispatched an immediate decision sustaining Van on every point of his contention. This verdict failed to reach him because the planetary circuits of communication were severed while it was in transit. Only recently was this actual ruling discovered lodged in the possession of a relay energy transmitter where it had been marooned ever since the isolation of Urantia. Without this discovery made as a result of the investigations of the Urantia midwares, the release of this decision would have awaited the restoration of Urantia to the constellation circuits. And this apparent accident, accident of interplanetary communication was possible because energy transmitters can receive and transmit intelligence but they cannot initiate communication. The technical status of Van on the legal records of Santinia was not actually and finally settled until this ruling of Edentia Fathers was recorded on Jerusalem. Personal, centripetal consequences of the creature's willful and persistent rejection of light are both inevitable and individual and are of concern only to deity and to that personal creature. Such a soul-destroying harvest of iniquity is the inner reaping of the iniquitous will creature. But not so with the external repercussions of sin. The impersonal, centrifugal consequences of embraced sin are both inevitable and collective, being of concern to every creature functioning within the av affect range of such events. By 50,000 years after the collapse of the planetary administration, earthly affairs were so disorganized and retarded that the human race had gained very little over the general ev evolutionary status existing at the time of Caligastus' arrival 350,000 years previously. In certain respects, progress had been made. In other directions, much ground had been lost. Sin is never purely local in its effects. The administrative sectors of the universe are organismal. The plight 
of one personality must to a ex certain extent be shared by all. Sin, being an attitude of the person towards reality, is destined to exhibit its inherent negativistic harvest upon any and all related levels of universe values, but the full consequences of erroneous thinking, evil doing, or sin sinful planning are experienced only on the level of actual performance. The transgression of universe law may be fatal in the physical realm without seriously involving the mind or impairing the spiritual experience. Sin is fraught with failed, fatal consequences to personality survival only when it is the attitude of the whole being, when it stands for the choosing of the mind and the willing of the soul. Evil and sin visit their consequences in material and social realms and may sometimes even retard spiritual progress on certain levels of universe reality, but never does the sin of any being rob another of the realization of the div divine right of personality survival. Eternal survival can be jeopardized only by the decisions of the mind and the choice of the soul of the individual himself. Sin on Urantia did very little to delay biologic evolution, but it did operate to deprive the mortal races of the full benefit of the Adamic inheritance. Sin enormously retards intellectual development, moral growth, social progress, and mass spiritual attainment, but it does not prevent the highest spiritual achievement by any individual who chooses to know God and sincerely do his divine will. Caligostia rebelled, Adam and Eve did default, but no mortal subsequently born on Urantia has suffered in his personal spiritual experience because of these blunders. Every mortal born on Urantia since Caligostia's rebellion has been in some manner time penalized, but the future welfare of such souls has never been in the least eternity jeopardized. No person is ever made to suffer vital spiritual deprivation because of the sin of another. Sin is wholly personal as to moral guilt or spiritual consequences, notwithstanding its far-flung repercussions in administrative, intellectual, and social domains. While we cannot fathom the wisdom that permits such catastrophes, we can always discern the beneficial outworking of these local disturbances as they are reflected out upon the universe at large. The Lucifer Rebellion was withstood by many courageous beings on the various worlds of Santania, but the records of Salvington portray Amadon as the outstanding character of the entire system of his glorious reflection of the flood tides of sedition and in his unswerving devotion to Van. They stood together, unmoved in their loyalty to the supremacy of the Invisible Father and his son, Michael. At the time of these momentous transactions, I was stationed at Nidentia, and I am still conscious of the exhilaration I experienced as I pursued the Salvington broadcasts, which told from the day to day of the unbelievable steadfastness, the transcendent devotion, and the exquisite loyalty of this one-time semi-savage springing from the experimental and original stock of the Adonic race. From Adentia through Salvington, and even on Uversa, for seven long years the first inquiry of all subordinate celestial life regarding the Centennial Rebellion ever and always was. What of Amadon of Urantia? Does he still stand unmoved? If the Lucifer Rebellion has handicapped the local system and its fallen worlds, 
if the loss of this son and his misled associates has temporarily hampered the progress of the constellation of Norlangetek, then weigh the effect of the far-flung presentation of the inspiring performance of this one child of nature and his determined band of 143 comrades in standing steadfast for the higher concepts of universe management and administration in the face of such tremendous and adverse pressure exerting by his disloyal supervisors. And let me assure you that this has already done more good in the universe of Nebadon and the super-universe of Orvantan than can ever be outweighed by the sum total of all the evil and sorrow of the Lucifer Rebellion. And all this is a beautifully touching and superbly magnificent illumination of the wisdom of the Father's universal plan for mobilizing the core of mortal finality on paradise and for the recruiting of this vast group of mysterious servants of the future largely from the common clay of the mortals of ascending progression, just such mortals as the impregnable Amadon. Presented by a Melchizedek of Nebadon. As you have heard this read, you can see it's a very complex presentation of these heroes of the post-rebellion time. Hopefully, you can see how it is meant to honor those heroes for their loyalty to God's eternal career. Thank you very much, Callie, for being my associate. I desire to end this with some personal words to each of you who have viewed our podcast. Thank you for watching the episodes and leaving such wonderful comments. We invite you to share personal insights about the 100 and their special mission on your rancha. Aloha Nui Loa!